thanks to all our presenters. And um, so now we can open up the floor to questions from the audience. If you state your name and affiliation and go ahead. Um, oh, there's a microphone here. Yeah. Here. <laughs> Uh, Andrew Bowser with Internal Medicine News. Thank you for taking my question. This is uh, for Dr. Statler. Um, I think your conclusion is that exclusion criteria focused on creatinine level may be a barrier to clinical trial enrollment for African Americans. I, th I think the data you showed was just overall though, correct? With re uh, the relationship between creatinine and, uh, cre uh, and survival. And you showed, I think there was one, and then two had very kind of wider confidence intervals. Um, did you look specifically at survival for this cohort for the African Americans versus non African Americans? Yes, yeah, so we did do subgroup analyses where we looked at just the African American patient population, and the outcomes were very similar. So patients who presented with minor creatine or creatine abnormalities prior to the initiation of therapy had similar overall survival to those without such abnormalities, and that was even exclusively within the African American group. When you looked at subgroup analyses or even in primary analyses, did you consider looking at EGFR as well? Because I doesn't, um, I believe EGFR would also account for different variables, including race, so would there be any value in looking at EGFR levels um, and the relationship between EGFR levels and survival? So we, did, we looked at creatine clearance level, level variables, but we did not look at EGFR specifically. Um, but that would be something to do in the, in the future analysis for sure. And just really quickly, not to hog the mic here, but um, is there a body of literature prior to this looking at kidney function, the relationship between kidney function and survival in AML patients? Um, there is, there, to my knowledge, there is not anything that looks at this level of granularity as far as kidney function and compares outcomes among African Americans and whites in the context of AML. We are the first, to my knowledge, to do this. Hi, uh, Neil Osterweil with Hematology News. Question for Dr. Ghosh, please. So um, what are the incremental costs of the nurse navigator and do um, third-party payers uh, object to it? Are they okay with it? You know, what's the, how, what's the... Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I actually don't know what the what the costs are for the nurse navigation program. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, I don't know if there has been any problem with uh, reimbursement or how the charges go. But those are things we, I can look at and uh, and let you know. Um, uh, I don't know if Dr. Avalos is in uh, is in the audience. She's very senior at our place, and I don't know if she has any insights about the cost for nurse navigation program, but. Cost driven by our cancer institute, so I don't think it's directly appended to patient charges. It's a cost that our institute has decided to cover. Thanks. Additional questions? Oh. Please. Are, do you have a question? Uh, Alice Goodman with the ASCO Post. Dr. Kilgore, could you explain the differences between those um, reimbursement systems, because I've heard that discussed at, at meetings as an important thing. It, it is. Uh, now, let me uh, give a caveat, if I may. I'm not a reimbursement expert. I'm an epidemiologist, but uh, I, I, I do know I can, I can, address, I can address it. Um, the, the distinction is between the standard inpatient prospective payment system, uh, which and and PP, uh, PPS, and PPS exempt cancer hospitals. Most hospitals uh, are uh, reimbursed from Medicare, and other payers tend to tend to go as Medicare does, are reimbursed under the. Per prospective payment system, a complex set of rules centered around something called DRGs, right? We all know what that is, DRGs. So there's a base rate uh, that, is, that is tied to the setting of care. There is a, uh, a DRG payment, which is tied to the characteristics of the patient and what happens when they're in the hospital and a bunch of other rules that come into play uh, that are, in some cases, hospital-based. hospital, hospital based. Are they a teaching hospital? There's an adjustment for that. Uh, do they see a disproportionate uh, number of indigent patients? All of this outlier payments for exceptions, and one important piece of the, of, of the standard reimbursement uh, uh, set of rules is that applies here is something called NTAP, the Novel 
techno new technology uh, add-on payment. Thank you. Okay, this comes into play here because CAR T, uh, D, uh, CMS uh, uh, designated CAR T as uh, appropriate for the NTAP. Okay, but all of that is a set of rules, complicated that, that they may be been around for, uh, you know, the PPS has been around uh, for, for the, to, uh, as a reimbursement, primary reimbursement system for hospitals, for inpatient facilities for a long time. That is acute, uh, short-term acute hospitals, uh, rehabs, different that kind of thing. Okay, uh, the ACA uh, created a, a set of hospitals that were exempt from the inpatient prospective payment system, most notably cancer hospitals. There's, I believe, 11 of them, big names that you would recognize. These are, are large centers that see a high frequency of complex cancer cases, uh, and, and, uh, and it turns out that their cost structure is very different than the rest of the universe of hospitals. I'm taking up too much time. Let me get to the point. As I understand it, how the PPS exempt cancer hospitals are paid, it's based on their historical performance uh, and uh, cost, historical costs. And those payments are determined, uh, are, are lagged by something like two years. Okay, CAR-T wasn't around two years ago. And so you see, and so when you look at the cost data, which uh, I, didn't, I didn't want to provide that much data here, it's in the, it'll be in the talk on Monday if you, if you want to come, and I, and I have it. Uh, we can talk about it later. The costs for, the, the, and again, paid amount uh, by Medicare and, and, and the other sources uh, uh, was, uh, was uh, 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 about a third for the, for the, uh, for the PPS exempt hospitals compared to the PPS based hospitals. Okay, hi, uh, John Giever from MedPage Today, and I have another question for Dr. Kilgore. So, um, looking looking at, at the total totality of, of your your data here, um, you've shown that uh, um, these older patients, uh, although they were um, uh, sicker and, and different from the clinical trial population in important ways, they were still able to get the treatment under Medicare, and their their outcomes were were good. So, does could you not argue that um, the fact that that many of these patients could have been excluded from the clinical trials probably were um, that that didn't matter? <laughs> uh, I, it, I think it could be argued. I'm, I'm reluctant. I'm reluctant to to step too far away from the data that I have with 207 patients and and uh, and one year one year of experience. Um, but uh, I, I think I think that uh, that 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 argument could be made. Okay. And Dr. Michaelis, would you perhaps like to respond to that? Uh, so, yeah, I mean, that's one of the optimistic things is many times drugs get approved and we use them no matter what the clinical trial eligibility said because they're actually in our, in our clinics. However, if these patients had been eligible for the clinical trials, as might be reasonable if there wasn't, then one could think about that drug having been approved a lot earlier than it was before because accrual would have been higher. And it might have represented, one of the things that's notable here is that the patients that are actually getting this drug, right, tended to be of higher affluence, right? We don't know the delivery is gonna, the delivery of the patients that are getting it on, that are covered, et cetera, or that get to a center where you can have it, uh, isn't necessarily the number of people that need it. So we still don't know about how the deployment of the drug has been in terms of equity. But we do know that you could have employed sicker, put sicker people on this study, and they could have done just as well, so why didn't we do that? I mean, that's my editorial, so. I, I don't understand why you say they tended to be of higher affluence. Into the microphone. So uh, I think, and I could be wrong, but it wasn't the pro higher proportion? It, I don't. We don't have a comparison to that, so I can't say higher affluence. Yes, you're right. They were 78 percent white, which is not representative of the American population. They were 78 percent white, so not really representative of the overall population. I'll let you clarify. Right, actually, actually, uh, they were they were eighty seven percent white. 
and we can't say, because all we have is who got the treatment, we can't say who didn't get the treatment. So in the absence of some comparator group of other high-risk diffuse large B-cell lymphoma patients, we don't know the equity of the deployment of this technology. And, and let's, if, if I may, um, that is, that is a, a, a plan that we have in place to undertake is to do a match sample. These are the patients that got it. Uh, an idea that kind of falls out of that is we have the same, we have these data, and and to to construct a, a matched sample of patients with all the same criteria except patients who did not get CAR T, uh, maybe got stem cell transplant, maybe uh, don't know. Working on that, but that's that's a study that I think should be done. Absolutely. Hi, Mary Caffrey, American Journal of Managed Care. So the issue with Medicare and reimbursement has been a huge source of controversy over the past year. And even with the, the minor bump in uh, the NTAP uh, jump that's supposed to happen for 2020, um, JCO reported on uh, the commentary on November 1st that the hospital the commentators estimated that hospitals lose $300,000 per treatment with these and that the travel burdens on the patients probably are one of the things that account for the projection that more affluent people get it because they have to absorb a lot of their own travel costs. Um, so where, where do we go from here? I mean, how do, uh, if, if, as you say, post-treatment, the hospitalization drops precipitously, I mean, what happens now? I mean, d I mean, have you had discussions with, I know sometimes you have discussions with Medicare about these kinds of findings. Are those kind of discussions happening? Great question. Uh, this, this speaker doesn't have a lot of information on that, I'm afraid. Uh, the, the, uh, I can certainly, I would certainly refer you to the, to the manufacturers themselves who are, who are uh, uh, very, very, very much engaged in, in having these, in having these discussions. Um, uh, but this this was not this was not a cost effectiveness study, for example. This was and and we're still we're still looking at what those costs were. I'll tell you that for the for the patients treated and outpatient, uh, who are which is a not is a is a is a is, a, is, is not a PPS exempt cancer hospital, and the patients who were treated in regular PPS hospitals, their total costs for the CAR T stay was was much more than the the cost of the drug itself or the, the sticker price if you will cost itself uh, these are sick patients <laughs> there's a there's a lot going on and so there's my, my point my point in this context is only that is that uh, that's a that is a complex that is a complex question and and uh, and, and our research, our, our research takes a very small step toward toward illuminating that discussion. It's not a policy study. It's not a reimbursement study. It's a descriptive study. Yes. Microphone. Thanks. Um, a question for Dr. D'Souza. Um, so you showed in in one of your your data slides that uh, um, the, the percentage of of the older patients who um, got the transplant increased quite dramatically over the course of the study. So if you had restricted it to just the last year when, when the, that percentage was 28 percent, what would that have done to your, to your overall results? I think that that needs to be taken into context of also the, the other disparity, right, like with racial disparities. So even though the numbers have gone up, we have in another study shown that amongst racial and ethnic minorities, that number has not gone up in the same proportion as, as it has um, amongst the whites. And if you think about myeloma, this is a disease of racial disparities. It's the incidence of myeloma is two times more common in African Americans in the country. But whenever we look at transplant data, only a fifth of patients that make it to transplant are black. Uh, so we are losing a lot of patients. And I think the, 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 the message of our study is that um, Every patient with myeloma should be referred to a transplant center. And similar to Dr. Ghosh's work, once they get to a transplant center, the disparity seems to go down. Uh, so I think it's getting people to the right academic centers that might help target this age racial disparity issue.
Great. Thank you very much, everyone, for being here. And uh, this concludes the press conference.